It was early morning on August 26th, 1980. Two men dressed in white jumpsuits parked their white IBM van outside Harvey's Resort Hotel and Casino to deliver a photocopy machine. They wheeled it in, concealed under an IBM cover, and left it in the executive offices of the hotel. A note was also left. It was an extortion letter that explained that the machine was actually a highly sophisticated homemade bomb. Hotel employees were the first to discover this strange machine. Hotel security found an envelope on the floor and initially suspected it was a letter bomb. They took cover behind the large metal box, the actual bomb, and poked the envelope with a broom handle. After determining that it wasn't a letter bomb, they opened the envelope to find a lengthy extortion note. Bomb threats were not entirely unheard of in the casino district of State Line, Nevada, near Lake Tahoe, thanks to the combination of financial losses and excessive alcohol consumption. But these attempts at extortion were usually half-baked and almost always ended with the discovery of a fake device or no bomb at all. Yet, investigators soon realized that the 1,200-pound bomb sitting in the hotel's second floor where 600 guests were staying for Labor Day weekend was not a hoax. The Douglas County Sheriff's Office swiftly cleared the area, herding thousands of bewildered guests from nearby casinos and hotels onto buses to a high school and other hotels a safe distance away. Authorities dusted the bomb for fingerprints and also x-rayed it, confirming that it contained about 1,000 pounds of dynamite. Attached to the bomb was a three-page extortion letter that explained in great detail how there was no way the bomb could be disarmed. It was equipped with mechanisms that prevented it from being moved or taken apart. It couldn't be tilted, shaken, or flooded as it contained a float switch and atmospheric switch, both connected to detonators. Even the flathead screws that held the bomb together were all connected to triggers. As much as a quarter to three quarters of a turn would cause an explosion. The letter implied that there was enough dynamite inside to destroy everything within a 1200 feet radius. The demands were for $3 million in used, unmarked $100 bills in exchange for the instructions on how to properly move the bomb. There were highly detailed instructions for the money's delivery as well. They wanted a solo pilot to bring them the money via helicopter to a location that would be revealed later. With the area now secured and the general public out of harm's way, curious onlookers began to gather at the roadblocks and barriers, watching in anticipation. Bookmakers from other casinos even started taking bets on if and when the bomb would go off. Explosives experts from various agencies were summoned to analyze the strange homemade device, including the Tahoe Douglas Bomb Squad, US Army Explosives Disposal Personnel, the Nuclear Emergency Team, and the Nevada State Fire Marshal. Time was of the essence. Nobody could be sure that the bomb wouldn't go off at any moment. The bomb was made up of two stacked steel boxes. The top box had 28 toggle switches, but it could not be determined what any of them were for. But it was believed that the triggering mechanisms were in the top box and the dynamite was all in the bottom box. Leonard Wolfson, an arms expert, had proposed using a Monroe Effect shaped charge, an explosive device that would focus a flat jet of energy and cut through the bomb like a knife in less than a millisecond. In short, they wanted to sever all the wires that connected the triggering mechanism in the top box from the dynamite in the bottom box. Harvey Gross, the owner of Harvey's resort, hotel, and casino, was informed of the plan and was also warned of the high chance of failure. Gross was unfazed by the potential destruction of his hotel. He was mostly concerned about his hundreds of employees losing work. The C4 field shaped charge was manufactured by a defense contractor in Las Vegas and flown up to Lake Tahoe. At 3.43 p.m., nearly 35 hours after the bomb had been discovered, Tahoe Douglas Bomb Squad Captain Danny Daniel made his way to the second floor of Harvey's to set up the charge that would hopefully separate the two steel boxes. He then exited the building to remotely detonate the charge. A countdown commenced over the radios. Then,
plan didn't work. John Burgess Sr. immigrated from Hungary to the United States with his wife Elizabeth in 1957. He claimed to have been a pilot in the German Luftwaffe, or Air Force, during World War II and provided intelligence to the US before he was captured and sentenced to hard labor in the Soviet Gulag. He was a tough, hardworking man who decided to start a landscaping business in his new home of Clovis in Fresno County, California. He was a savvy businessman, but he had a bad temper. His employees were afraid of him, and he was physically violent with his two sons, Johnny Jr. and Jim. By 1972, Burgess had grown his three businesses considerably and became a millionaire. But the money didn't bring happiness to his marriage, and Elizabeth filed for divorce in November 1973. In July 1975, Elizabeth's body was found in a field behind the Burgess' house. Her death was ruled a suicide, but her sons strongly suspected that their father was involved. John Burgess Sr. began to visit Lake Tahoe more and more frequently on gambling trips, and soon became a regular high roller at the blackjack tables at Harvey's Casino. Over the next several years, Burgess would gamble recklessly at Harvey so often that he was comped his favorite suite in the hotel every visit and also befriended staff members there. He'd stock up his garage and walk-in freezer at home full of food and disappeared to Harvey's, leaving his two young sons to fend for themselves. By 1980, Burgess had lost at least $750,000 gambling. He decided he was going to recover his money by extorting the casino. He began to use his time gambling there to observe the operations of the staff, the timing of security shift changes, and even measured the height of the curb outside the lobby entrance. Burgess then recruited his two sons to help him with the extortion plan, Johnny now aged 19 and Jim 18. Johnny had a particularly strained relationship with his father. He had dropped out of school and moved out of the house at age 16, working odd jobs and doing some small time weed milling. Jim was more studious and straight laced, but the two brothers had a strong bond rooted in shared contempt for their father. Despite their tense relationship with John Sr., the two boys still sought his approval and wanted to help him out of his financial troubles, so they agreed to go along with the extortion plan. On June 10, 1980, John Burgess Sr. and his sons drove Johnny Jr.'s white Dodge van into the Sierra Nevada mountains to the construction site of the Helms Power Plant, an underground hydroelectric pumping facility. They broke into the explosive storage using a welding torch to cut off the locks and stole more than 1,000 pounds of Hercules Unigel dynamite sticks. They then drove back to Burgess' home in Clovis and stored the dynamite in his walk-in freezer. Burgess had always enjoyed tinkering in his garage, but he would spend the next two months focused on his next and final project, a bomb with multiple triggering mechanisms that was completely tamper-proof. His girlfriend, Ella Joan Williams, a Fresno County probation officer, wrote the three-page extortion letter. On August 24th, Burgess asked his former employee, Bill Brown, and his son-in-law, Terry Hall, to do a delivery job for $2,000 each. He told them about his plan, and they agreed. That night, Bill Brown and Terry Hall borrowed Johnny Jr.'s white Dodge van and drove to Lake Tahoe with the bomb loaded in the back. They met up with Burgess at Harvey's the next morning. Burgess guided them through the hotel and casino and explained how they would be getting the bomb through the lobby. That night, the three men checked into the Balaho Motel using a fake name, Joey Avedo. The following morning, they tidied up the room, wiping down any fingerprints, then drove the white van to Harvey's. Burgess had constructed a system of metal ramps and pulleys, along with a rolling cart that matched the height of the curb, in order to get the bomb out of the van and into the hotel. Brown and Hall carefully rolled the bomb, covered by a cloth with the IBM logo, inside, and up the elevator to the second floor where Burgess was waiting for them. He positioned the bomb in the corridor of the hotel's executive offices, placed down the three-page extortion letter, then left and drove back to his Clovis home to get some sleep. Once the bomb had been discovered, the FBI began to discuss the next course of action with Harvey Gross, the owner of Harvey's resort, hotel, and casino. The FBI informed Gross that there was a high likelihood of the bomb destroying his hotel, but Gross defiantly refused to pay the ransom. 
Three canvas bags were filled with sacks of paper, then topped off with some real $100 bills supplied by Harvey's. The three bags were loaded into an FBI helicopter, which was flown by US Navy pilot Joe Cook to the Lake Tahoe airport to await further instructions from the extortionists, as per their letter. FBI Special Agent Del Rowley, armed with a submachine gun, was hidden in the small cargo space in the helicopter. Shortly after midnight, John Burgess Sr., his girlfriend Ella Williams, and his two sons launched into the next phase of their elaborate plan. They were going to force the helicopter pilot to meet them at a secret location, ambush him at gunpoint, steal the helicopter, take the cash, land it at Cameron Park Airport, then drive back to Clovis. After they all dispersed to their various positions, John Jr. called Lake Tahoe Airport from a payphone, directing the helicopter pilot to locate a hidden letter which explained how to get to the meetup location. However, the directions provided were either too vague or inaccurate, and pilot Joe Cook never saw the strobe light signal mentioned in the letter. He returned to Lake Tahoe Airport in case the extortionists called again, but they never did. At 2.30 a.m., the FBI made a public appeal for the extortionists to contact the authorities again to clarify their instructions. At 5 a.m., Burgess, who had not heard the appeal, decided to abandon the plan after the helicopter never showed up. Ella Williams, who had been waiting at Cameron Park Airport all night as the final getaway driver, had heard the FBI appeal over the radio, but she crashed her car going around a hairpin turn on Ice House Road and had to be rushed to hospital. In the early hours of the morning on August 27th, Burgess, now slightly panicked, attempted to buy time by contacting the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. He told them to flip switch five on the bomb. The diversion worked to an extent, as the bomb experts did discuss creating a device that could flip the switch remotely, but ultimately decided to disregard the instruction. Switch 5, in actuality, did nothing. Later that afternoon, the bomb experts planned to disarm the bomb with a shaped charge failed, and John Burgess's bomb exploded. The bomb blew a huge five-story chasm through the building, but fortunately, nobody was injured or killed. It looked like a war zone with piles of cement ruins, tangles of electrical cables, and twisted rebar. Debris, including casino chips and cash, were scattered everywhere, with fragments found as far as four blocks away. In the aftermath, the FBI immediately started searching for clues. Agents spent weeks sifting through the rubble, collecting debris, and analyzing potential evidence that could shed light on the bomb's origin. The total cost of the damage was estimated to be $18 million. Within hours, neighboring casinos reopened and gamblers flocked back. An old, undamaged part of Harvey's reopened just 48 hours after the blast. A temporary wall was put up with a window installed so guests could view the blast site and watch authorities gather evidence. Local vendors in state lines started selling t-shirts that read, I survived the bomb scare and get bombed at Harvey's. Supervising FBI agent Joseph Yablonski revealed to the media that they had followed the extortionists' instructions, had made contact with them, and brought the $3 million to the agreed upon location, but no one showed up to meet the helicopter pilot. The identity of the extortionists was still a mystery. A special phone hotline was set up, with tips from the public being pursued by FBI agents as well as Nevada and California police officers. Criminal records and intelligence databases were scoured for people who possessed the technical expertise required to build a bomb. Fingerprints that had been found on the bomb didn't have any matches. Harvey's employees who witnessed the two men posing as IBM workers were interviewed and some were even questioned under hypnosis. The extortion letter was scrutinized to come up with a psychological profile of its author, but the pages were typewritten with no misspellings. Lee Frankovic, a spokesman from the casino, announced a $175,000 reward for any information leading to an arrest and conviction. Finally, a few days after the explosion, a breakthrough arrived. Gerald Dominico, the owner of the Balaho Motel, contacted authorities to report a couple of men with a white van who had stayed at the motel the night before the bomb was delivered. They had requested jumper cables at around 4 a.m. 
and Domenico's wife had written down the van's license plate number. The FBI traced the license plate number to 20-year-old John Burgess Jr. When questioned, Johnny Jr. made up a story about scouting the area for a place to plant marijuana, but the FBI didn't buy it. Within a few months, the Burgess family were being surveilled round the clock. A federal grand jury was convened in Reno, and Johnny Jr. was called to testify about his van and the bombing. After he repeated his marijuana story under oath, the FBI arrested him on August 15, 1981, nearly a year after the bombing. It was obvious that Johnny Jr. was not the mastermind behind the extortion plan, so the FBI threatened to send him to federal prison on perjury charges unless he would testify against the other people involved in the bombing. Johnny Jr. flipped and gave a full, detailed confession, implicating his father. His younger brother Jim was also brought in and offered the same deal, testify against his father and the other perpetrators in exchange for leniency from the US Attorney's Office. Jim Burgess also led the FBI to a dry creek bed in Clovis, where he had helped his father bury another batch of stolen dynamite that would have been used in a second extortion attempt. On August 15th, 1981, John Burgess Sr. and his girlfriend Ella Williams were arrested. Bill Brown and Terry Hall, who had helped deliver the bomb, were both arrested the next day. During the trial, John Burgess Sr. adamantly denied building the bomb. Over the course of four years of trials and appeals, he cycled through several defense lawyers and even represented himself at one point. He claimed to have gambling debts with the mob and was forced by an unnamed mob member to carry out the extortion plan. Burgess even cross-examined his own sons, speaking to them like they were strangers. On October 22, 1982, John Burgess Sr. was found guilty of federal extortion and bombing charges. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. His sons, John Burgess Jr. and Jim Burgess, each pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy, but neither served prison time in exchange for testifying against their father. Bill Brown, Terry Hall, and Ella Williams were each sentenced to seven years. John Burgess Sr. died of liver cancer in August 1996 in the Southern Nevada Correctional Center. None of his accounts about his life in Europe as a Luftwaffe pilot or spy for the US were able to be verified. In May 1981, the fully renovated and repaired Harveys reopened to the public. Five years later, Harveys expanded and opened a brand new $100 million 18-story hotel building. Burgess's homemade bomb is still regarded as one of the most unique improvised explosive devices in the FBI's history and a replica is still used for training purposes today.